am Dr. Suman Srestha, MD Anesthesiologist. I'll be, today I'll be discussing few questions related to anesthesia and critical care. I hope this will be very beneficial for all the PG aspirants uh, for their future coming exams. So first of all, I would like to wish you all the best for the coming exams and I'll be discussing few questions related to my topic today. So first question is, which of the following is the supraglottic airway devices? The options here are combi tube, endotracheal uh, tube, nasopharyngeal airway, and right angle endotracheal tube. Before discussing the answer, first we should know what are the supra, uh, supraglottic airway devices. What do we understand by the supraglottic airway devices? So, devices used to ventilate the patient above the level of vocal cord. These are called the supraglottic airway devices. So, uh, it is different from those intraglottic devices. In supraglottic devices, the ventilation is done above the glottis. That, we, that means above the level of the vocal cord. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of these kinds of devices? The first advantage is, since the devices are placed in supraglottic region, they are less invasive to respiratory tra tract. They are better uh, tolerated. And since they are above the level of focal cord, there is less chances of sore throat. So these are the advantages of supraglottic devices. So what are the, the disadvantages of supraglottic devices? Since I have already mentioned that the, these devices are placed above the level of focal cord, they will never prevent aspiration. So the risk, there is high risk of aspiration. So the answer for above question uh, is, a, that is combi tube. Combi tube is a supraglottic device. Combi tube is placed above the level of vocal cord. It has two balloons. One, it, one lies uh, at the tra level of trachea and another lies at the level above the trachea, above the vocal cord. So, combi tube is a supra supraglottic device. The next option, endotracheal tube. Uh, endotrach endotracheal tube is placed in intra uh, is placed below the level of vocal cord, so it is not the supraglottic device, it is intratracheal device. So the option is excluded. Next is the next option was nasopharyngeal airway. Since I have already mentioned, supraglottic devices are used to those devices that are used to ventilate the patient, but the nasopharyngeal airway are never used to ventilate the patient. These devices are kept, uh, are used to keep the airway patent, not for ventilation purpose. So, the uh, next option, nasopharyngeal airway, is also excluded. Endotracheal tube and the ray tube. Ray tube is also a type of endotracheal tube. So, ray tube is also placed uh, place below the level of vocal cord. Uh, vocal cord. So, it is. Uh, it is also. Uh, so, the ray tube is also not the uh, supraglottic device. Device. So, this option is also excluded. So, the answer for Above, uh, above ops, uh, the answer for the question is A, combi tube. Now the next question is, which of the following regional block anesthesia is associated with maximum risk of pneumothorax? The options here are axillary blo block, brachial block, interscalene block, and supraclavicular block. So all these options are the block used for upper limb surgeries. As shown in the picture, all, the, all those blocks are used to block at the different level of brachial plexus. The components of brachial plexus are root, trunk, division, cord, and the terminal branches. So each block uh, mentioned in the options is given in the particular site which blocks the particular region. So as shown in the picture, interscalene block it blocks the root. So the point to be remember, the point that should be remembered are the particular site which is blocked by a particular block. It's it is also one of the important uh, questions that may be asked in the future uh, future exams. So first is interscalene block. Interscalene block blocks the root. Second is supraclavicular block. Supraclavicular block blocks at the level of division and the trunk. And third is infraclavicular block. It blocks at the level of cord. And next is axillary block. 
axillary block blocks at the terminal branches such as axillary nerve, median nerve, radial nerve, and the ulnar nerve. So this table explains the different uh, level, different uh, uh, complications of the brachial plexus block. All the uh, all the options are the type of brachial plexus block. So the question was uh, what which block causes pneumothorax? So from this table, let us um, uh, let us uh, review the complications. First is interscalene blo block. The point to be remember here is it blocks at the level of root. Next is it blocks. Uh, this block is used for shoulder and upper arm and all elbow. So since the interscalene block is given at the level of root at the highest point so this block is used to for the surgeries of shoulder that is at the proximal layer uh, which is at the proximal region of upper limb and shoulder and upper arm so the complications the most important complication to be remember is interscalene block causes phrenic knob palsy this is what we should all always remember this is an important question for the future exam so Interscalene block causes phrenic knob palsy. The other complications are Horner's syndrome. Subarachnoid or epidural injection can be uh, can occur due to the interscalene block. And the rare complication is vertebral artery injection. The vertebral artery lies at the region at the level of the root. So uh, when we are giving uh, interscalene block at the level of root. We may sometimes pierce vertebral artery, and there may be re, the it, there may cause vertebral artery injection, which is a rare complication. But we should always remember phrenic knob palsy. This is very important point. The second is supraclavicular block. Supraclavicular block blocks the trunk and the proximal divisions, so it is used for entire arm. This is also one of the point. It is used for entire arm. So and the complication. The, that we should always remember is pneumothorax, which is asked in the question. So, pneumothorax, it is a particular compli uh, uh, complication that has highest incident with supraclavicular block. So, phrenic knob palsy is due to interscalene block, and pneumothorax is due to supraclavicular block. Phrenic knob palsy Horner syndrome can also occur due, uh, while giving supraclavicular block, but the most Important complication, most common complication is pneumothorax. And next is infraclavicular block. They are used, they are given at the level of cords and terminal branches. And the complications here are again the pneumothorax, but it is less common than the supraclavicular block. Now is the axillary, axillary block. Axillary block is given at the level, uh, at the level of terminal branches. So in axillary block, we will block axillary, uh, axillary nerve, uh, radial nerve, ulnar nerve. So they are so the particular nerves are blocked at the level of axillary, uh, axillary block. So the most common complication here is hematoma formation. This is what we should remember. So the answer for the above question is supraclavicular block which has highest incident of pneumothorax. So pneumo pneumothorax is cause uh, the highest chance of pneumothorax is while we give the supraclavicular block and phrenic knob palsy is seen with interscalene block. Now coming to the next question. What is compression ventilation ratio for the adult patient during CPR if only a single rescuer is present? So this is a very important clue in the question, single rescuer. Uh, this is a flowchart of basic life support. I have taken this from U European Resuscitation Council guideline 2021. This is the latest guideline. And as per this guideline, see, if there is a res unresponsive with absent or abnormal br breathing, the first point is call emergency services. Th then immediately start chest compression the chest compression when we are a single uh, rescuer 30 chest compression per minute 
which is followed by two rescue breaths. So the ratio here is 30 compression followed by two rescue breaths. So first there will be 30 compressions that will be followed by two rescue breaths. So the ratio is 30 is to 2. 30 compression followed by two ventilation. So answer here is D. 30 is to 2. That is the uh, comp uh, compression ventilation ratio when single rescuer is uh, present at the site. So while uh, dealing with this question, let us discuss about high quality compression. The compression ratio is 30 compression followed by 2 ventilation. So what type of compression should we give? What is the high quality compression that should be given to the patient? So high quality uh, compression has these components. These are the components of high quality compression. The first point is start chest compression as soon as possible. No delaying in the chest compression. If you see there is abnormal breath or absence of breath, start chest compression. Deliver a compression on the lower half of the sternum or that is at the center of the chest. The compression to a depth of at least 5 cm but not more than 6 cm. This is a very important point of a high quality CPR. One of the components of higher quality CPR that is. The depth should be at least of 5 cm but not more than 6 cm. The next component is the rate of compression 100 to 120 minute, uh, 120 compressions per minute without or as much as few uh, interruptions as possible. Another is allow the chest to recoil completely after each compression. Do not lean on the chest. So while giving the chest compression, First of all, the depth of compression should be at least 5 cm, not more than 6 cm. The rate should be 100 to 120 per minute. And with after each compression, we should allow the chest to recoil completely before next compression is started. And perform the chest compression on the form surface whenever possible. So these are the, the these are the components of high quality CPR, and the source is European Research Station Council guideline. 2021. And the next question is what is concentration of oxygen delivered to the patient while performing mouth to mouth respiration during the research station? The options are 16%, 21%, 40%, and 60%. So, first we should know what is the rescue breath. What do you mean by the rescue breath? Two rescue breaths are provided after 30 compressions. So, in previous questions, we have uh, we have talked about compression ventilation ratio. So, in previous questions, we have discussed the high quality compression. Now, we'll be discuss we'll be discussing high quality ventilation. So, the rescue breath that is given after it's uh, that is given after 30 compressions when there is a single user. So Two rescue breaths are provided after 30 compression. So, how will you give the uh, uh, rescue breath? First, pinch the soft part of the mouth close using the index and the thumb, using the index and the thumb of your hand on the, uh, using the index and the thumb of your hand, which is kept at the forehead. So, your hand should be at the forehead, and uh, the soft part of the nose should be compressed using index and the thumb. Uh, thumb finger. Then allow the victim mouth to open and maintain the thin lip. Take a normal breath and place your lips around the victim's mouth and make it ear tight seal. And blow steadily into the victim mouth while uh, and while uh, doing this, you will watch for the chest, uh, watch for the patient's chest to rise. And all this is done within one second. This is an important point. One second as in normal breath, and this is called as effective rescue breath. So the components of effective rescue breath is two rescue breath after 30 compression. It is given uh, before uh, before uh, the breath is given. You will pinch the soft part of the nose and allow the victim's mouth to uh, mouth to open, and then you will place your lips around the victim's mouth and make a ear tight seal. And you will blow slowly while watching for chest rise. These are the components of 
uh, effective rescue breath and the time here is one second and then when you give the rescue breath at last you will see you need to see for chest to fall uh, fall, fall back as the air comes out and then take another normal uh, normal breath and blow into the victim mouth and continue this process Do, we should not interrupt the compression while doing this for more than 10 seconds so this is another important point while giving a, res a rescue breath uh, when there is a single rescuer the two rescue breaths are given after 30 compression and uh, while giving the two rescue breath you should never interrupt more than 30 seconds and the re uh, rescuer's ex um, the concentration of oxygen that the rescuer gives to the patient is 16 to 17 percent oxygen there is 21 percent oxygen that we inhale and while giving the rescue breath will give the uh, will give the exiled air from the uh, uh, will give our exiled uh, exiled air to the patient so the concentration of oxygen is 16 to 17 percent the points to be remembered in these questions are the what is the eff uh, effective rescue breath the first point is the inter uh, it should be given in one second you should always watch the ch chest to uh, chest to fall back its, to its original position the uh, interruption of the ventilation should not be no more than 10 seconds and the concentration of oxygen is always 16 to 17 percent so the answer is a 16 percent now the next question is following the spinal anesthesia posterior puncture headache is seen after the duration of first is two weeks second option is 24 to 48 hours third option is five hours and the fourth option is five days so while dis uh, before discussing this question let's us uh, let let us discuss about the pathophysiology of postural puncture headache actually the actual pathophysiology uh, physiology is still incompletely understood no one can say the exact pathophysiology but experiment experimentally it is shown that the loss of 10 percent of csf volume results in postural puncture headache and it is due to the loss of csf and cerebral vasodilatation there is uh, cerebral vasodilatation which will cause traction and pressure or pressure on the pain sensitive structure within the cranium which will cause the headache so the first point is if exact pathophysiology is asked in the question the answer should always be it is incompletely understood the next is the experiment has shown that if there is loss of more than 10 percent of the csf volume there is there will be incident of posterior puncture headache and uh, experimentally uh, and uh, the pathophysiology that is brought in front that is um, uh, which is not proven but there is the theories uh, about the pathophysiology is it is due to the loss of csf and uh, cerebral vasodilatation due to the loss of csf which will cause traction and pressure on the pain sensitive area of the brain which will cause uh, posterior puncture headache and the source is Nysora which is a standard source for posterior puncture headache and spinal anesthesia so the onset of uh, the headache the, and the onset of the headache is 12 to 48 hours after posterior puncture uh, after the spinal anesthesia is given and it is rarely seen more than five days following the spinal anesthesia so the point here is the onset is 12 to 48 hours after the spinal anesthesia is uh, given so what how will we distinguish the posterior puncture headache from other type of headache the headache that follows the any surgeries which is done on the spinal anesthesia will not only be due to the posterior puncture headache it may be due to different other causes so the presentation of posterior puncture headache is, is particular which will help uh, us to distinguish the posterior puncture headache from other type of headache so the point here to be noted is the posterior puncture headache is always postural in nature so this means that this headache is aggravated 
uh, aggravated when we are upright. When the uh, uh, when the patient suddenly uh, sits from the supine position or uh, lying down position, the headache occurs. So it is always postural. This is very important point. This is and uh, this will help us to distinguish postural puncture headache from other type of headache. So next is it is always bilateral, and uh, particularly uh, particularly seen in frontal, occipital, or at the both uh, regions. And the nature is it is dull aching, throbbing, or pressure type headache, and it is uh, it may be associated with neck stiffness, nitus, photophobia, and nausea. So to distinguish postural puncture headache from other headache, the characteristics of this headache is it is always postural. Very important point: it is always postural, bilateral, dull aching, throbbing, thro throbbing type. Or pressure type, and it may be associated with neck stiffness, tinnitus, photophobia, nausea. So, the answer for the above question is postural puncture headache is seen 24 to 48 hours. That is option B. So, the next question is what is the cause of hypotension during spinal anesthesia? The options are hypovolemia, parasympathetic block. Sympathetic block and shifting of fluid to the extremities. Uh, before discussing the answer, let us see the pathophysiology, how the spinal anesthesia works. The spinal anesthesia blocks the sympathetic chain. It doesn't block parasympathetic chain. It blocks the sympathetic chain, which is the main mechanism here. Sympathetic knob block causes the hypotension. Since we know there are two systems working for uh, balancing of our blood pressure, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system causes vasoconstriction, which is its normal function, and parasympathetic tries, uh, causes vasodilatation. So while we are giving the sympathetic, well, sorry, while we are giving the spinal anesthesia, we are blocking the sympathetic nervous system. That means the work that is done by the sympathetic nervous system is cut down. As I have already said, sympathetic nervous system causes vasoconstriction that will help to maintain the BP, blood pressure. Since the sympathetic nervous system is blocked, its functions are blocked. As a result, the vasoconstrictive function due to sympathetic, uh, sympathetic nervous system is blunt. As a result, there will be vasodilatation. That means parasympathetic nervous system is more active. More active. As a result, there will vasodilatation, and this will cause peripheral pooling of the blood, and finally hypotension. So, here we, let's see. After giving the spinal anesthesia, when there is a sympathetic blockage, so I have already said there is there will be vasodilatation, peripheral pooling of the blood towards the extremities. So, preload is decreased. After load is decreased. Systemic vascular resistance is decreased and there is finally decrease in the cardiac output. These all points will finally cause hypotension. And let's and the heart rate here is increased due to hypotension. Since there is hypotension as a compensatory mechanism, heart rate get increased. But there will there may be decrease in the heart rate if there is blockage of sympathetic chain at the level of T1 to T4. Because from the T1 to T4, there is cardiac accelerating fibers are generated at these levels. These cardiac accelerating fibers, these cardiac accelerating fibers helps to maintain the heart rate. So when the uh, sympathetic chains are blocked at the level of T1 to T4, these cardiac accelerating fibers are blocked. As a result, there may be bradycardia. So the answer. But the above question is C, that is sympathetic block, which is the main reason for hypotension. The next uh, option was hypovolemia. Hypovolemia will aggravate the hypotension due to sympathetic block. Hypovolemia will uh, just aggravate the hypotension that is due to sympathetic block. It will, it is the not the sole reason for hypotension, but it will aggravate the hypotension. Hypotension, if uh, after the spinal anesthesia, if there is hypovolemia in the 
patient. So preloading is important before giving spinal anesthesia. We will give around 300 to 500 ml of crystalloid before giving the spinal anesthesia in patient without any cardiac issues. So uh, so that the hypovolemia is eliminated and if they and the chances of severe hypotension is too low. So the next question is the cause of gastric distension while performing bag and marks ventilation is the first option is lifting the jaw into the marks, too much tight seal, failure to open the airway, and giving too rapid and forceful ventilation. So first uh, why, before dealing this uh, question you should know that gastric distension is secondary to the air insufflation into the stomach while we uh, while we are giving bag and max while we are doing bag and max ventilation here the main sole purpose of uh, our main purpose is to ventilate the patient that means we are trying to push the air in the trachea and then to our the uh, and towards the lungs not in the esophagus and stomach but while giving the bag and bag and max ventilation the air may go within the stomach and cause gastric distension so but in every cases this doesn't occur it occurs when the esophageal sphincter opens and the gas uh, and the air that we have uh, we we use for ventilation goes towards the stomach. So, esophageal sphincter opens at a certain pressure, and the pressure is 20 centimeter of S2O. So, this is what we should remember. While we we'll, uh, while we ventilate the patient, if we will ventilate using higher pressure, that is pressure above 20 centimeter of S2O, then the esophageal sphincter gets open and instead and the all the e oxygen that we use for use to ventilate will and some part of the uh, oxygen that we use to ventilate we, we use for ventilation may go in the esophagus as the sphincter is open and then it goes to the stomach and cause gastric distension therefore a forceful bag and max ventilation which produces the pressure more than 20 centimeter S2O will cause esophageal sphincter to open and will cause gastric distension. So the answer here is D, too rapid and forceful ventilation. So if we ventilate the patient too rapidly and too forcefully, this will cause gastric distension. So this is all I am discussing. Uh, thank you. And this is all I have discussed. Seven questions related to anesthesia and critical care. Let's. Uh, I hope this will uh, be uh, very fruitful and helpful for all the PG aspirants and uh, not only the, these answers but the explanations with these uh, related to these answers may help for, uh, help all of you for uh, dealing further more questions related to anesthesia and critical care. Thank you.